the lead up to Christmas. How are you? Hope you're having a good time. I'm off for the holidays, which is lovely. So, I figured, seeing as we're just before Christmas, I'm going to talk about a game series that I've never really had the chance to talk about, which is very exciting. And that's Bioshock. Um, today we're talking about Bioshock. My memories with the series, my time with it, my longing for a new one that we're hopefully going to get with Judas, um, which is Ken Levine's new game um, that they showcased last year. We'll see how that turns out. I'm not holding my breath. Um, larger because I've been burnt one too many times with um, big names coming back to do a game before. Looking at you, John Romero. No, I'm kidding. John Romero is a saint. Um, more looking at Hideo Kojima and Death Stranding. Anyway, moving on to uh, the first game. This is my original copy so, of the original Bioshock. And the thing that really attracted it to me was just the words genetic civil war and genetic arms race. That is very cool. That's a fascinating concept. That was, I was, how old was I in 2000 and... Seven? 2007. 2007. I was 14. <laughs> so, a little bit too young to be playing Bioshock, but that's okay. Um, at the time, I was friends uh, with a guy called Anthony, a uh, nice guy. And uh, he and I met up uh, in, a, in a town kind of uh, between the two of us uh, with another mutual friend of ours. And for my birthday, I'd gone, hey, could you could you get me Bioshock? Because it had just come out. And you know what? It was a 10 out of 10, 95% right out of the gate. And for a while, exclusive to 360 and Windows. Um, this was at a time where Xbox knew what exclusives were and had gone, hey, let's nab up some decent games like Bioshock and the original Mass Effect and other assorted titles. Because 2007 was a very good year. Yeah, first game to Bioshock, and initially I'm not sold. I wasn't initially sold on the game. Um, but that did change. Because so, bearing in mind, I was 14, I was stupid, as we all are at that age. And I didn't quite get it, nothing quite clicked, and then I kept playing. So I got through the first bit, I got through Medical Pavilion, then I got through blah, and blah, and blah, and blah. Before I knew it, right at the end of a bloody fantastic game. A bloody fantastic game. Um, a lot of the themes of objectivism and Iron Rand completely over my head. Because again, 14. Probably not the best time to play Bioshock, actually. Um, I don't think Bioshock at the age of 14 is, is quite the best way to play it. Most you're going to get out of it is the gameplay and maybe, maybe, um, oh, what the heck is his name? Andrew Ryan's performance. Outside of that, I would argue that you're not getting a whole lot out of it. As I got older, though, I have played it nigh on to death. Um, I even went out of my way to buy the DLC on the PS3 version back in the day, um, although I've I got rid of that version a couple of years ago when I cleaned house on the PS3 collection because there's no point keeping a game I've got at least twice. So, I had to keep my original copy there. Come on. That being said, uh, a few years ago I did pick up the Metal Case version. I believe this is the one that came with the Big Daddy. The Big Daddy toy that was notorious for breaking within five seconds of opening the box. Um, so I've never owned that. I used to own a Patriot uh, figure from Bioshock Infinite, but uh, that's gone as well. A lot of my a lot of my figures and such left. Um, but yeah, that's getting off topic. As I got older, I kind of came to appreciate um, Bioshock's story, Bioshock's setting in particular, Rapture. I love Rapture to death. Um, I'm more of a Columbia guy because it's a city in the clouds with zeppelins and that tickles a certain area of my fancy. But um, 
Rapture is probably one of the single most iconic locations in gaming because it is a notoriously simple concept of a city under the sea. And that's it. That's really it. Now, within the context of the world, it makes a great deal of sense considering Andrew Ryan's sheer hatred of the surface and all of that stuff. Armin Shimmerman, that's it. Um, who, funnily enough, played Quark in Deep Space Nine. Um, another quite right-wing capitalist, well, not right-wing, but certainly objectivist. The self is all that matters, looking after others is stupid, blah, 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 greed. Greed is good. That being said, Quark is a very terrible objectivist, and in a strange way, so is Andrew Ryan. Um, Andrew Ryan is not an objectivist. He is a dictator, despot, asshole, and he's played marvellously. Um, in both Bioshock and Burial at Sea. But yeah, um, as I've gone older, I've come to appreciate Bioshock more. Specifically the first one. Um, in particular, it's pacing. Um, I think it's pacing is beautiful. Of the three games, it's probably got the single best pacing of all of them. However, I would argue it's got the single worst ending because its ending is just a extremely dull boss fight with an ending that is dictated by whether or not you accidentally killed a little sister. Because if you do so, you are a terrible person. Terrible, terrible, terrible. How could you do something so abhorrent? Cut to two years later. We get the announcement of Bioshock 2. Um, Bioshock 2 was meant to come out on the 30th of, Dis of October 2009. 2009 was an exceptionally rough year for me, so I was really looking forward to picking this game up. Um, at the time, I believe in October, I picked up Brutal Legend, which uh, then I found out that Bioshock 2 had been delayed for reasons I will get into, which insanely annoyed me and then I made the fatal mistake of buying Borderlands 1 which is a game I loathe. I hate that series. Um, I've been turned off it forever. Thank you. Thank you Handsome Jack. But yeah, um, annoying series and, and quite frankly an inferior inferior one to Bioshock. However, Bioshock 2 was delayed for one quite interesting reason. They wanted to work in characters from the uh, alternate reality video game, or augmented reality video game, which is a uh, game, sorry, which is kind of a marketing technique where you create a series of puzzles uh, for your kind of target fan base to pick apart, figure out, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it was called Something in the Sea. And the idea was that the big sisters from the game, who are kind of the little sisters them grown up and gone insane from uh drug withdrawal because everyone in rapture uses a copious amount of drugs that alters their genetic system to allow them to fire fireballs or lightning or ice or turn invisible and spy on people uh or see through walls which is horrifying when you're getting dressed um but it's rapture it's a hellhole <laughs> And anything that goes will go. So, however, they implemented some of the, the character from this something in the sea, who was called Mark Meltzer, who is a guy looking for his daughter. And he's combing through records and he's looking through this, that and the other. And he inevitably discovers very deep, deep in a lot of documentation from Andrew Ryan. Rapture. He discovers its location. He's able to track down someone who used to live there. Um, a character from the first game called Bridget Tenenbaum. I think it's Bridget Tenenbaum um, who he contacts. And he heads down. He heads down because he, she's looking as well. Because somebody has brought Rapture back to life. Somebody has dragged it out from the Aether and they have kick-started a new generation of little sisters, um, started a big old cult, and this time around it's about the difficulties with altruism. So whilst objectivism is predominantly a ex 
excruciatingly self-centred and selfish and, quite frankly, ridiculous school of thought. Um, one that prioritises independence over everything. Which is insane. Altruism is its natural opposite. So to have a character who's, quite frankly, using altruism to her own ends, uh, she's trying to gather all the minds from Rapture. All of the greatest intelligent minds. And kind of artificially fuse them into her own daughter's brain. Not her brain. As would be the altruistic thing to do. But her daughter's brain. I'm sacrificing my daughter. Is her idea. And she is a piece of work. Unfortunately she's not as interesting as Andrew Ryan is. As an antagonist. Um, I'd actually say the actress... Severely underplays Sophia Lamb, um, in quite a and is is quite a boring, boring, boring character. But Bioshock Two added some flavour to uh, Rapture, added some layers, some history, and more importantly, added the ability to play as a big daddy, which which you know what I'll get into. I like each of the Bioshock games. For different reasons. For one, it's its pacing and its twist. I think its twist is still one of the best in games. Um, coming off of the fact that Bioshock is a spiritual successor to System Shock. And the twist in the second game is quite prominent. But if you know what you're looking for, you can see a mile coming. If you really know what you're looking for in Bioshock 1, you can see a mile coming. A particular turn of phrase. Um might appeal to some people, but we'll see. Um, two, on the other hand, two has a more personal story about this big daddy character and uh, his little sister, who's now like 19. She's now considerably older, but she still, she views him as her father, as opposed to her mother, Sophia, who is in a an abhorrent monster, for all intents and purposes. Piece of shit. She's a piece of shit. However, I'd argue Bioshock 2 has a much bigger issue with its gameplay than, say, Bioshock 1. In Bioshock 1, let's be fair, you're told, oh, if you sacrifice the little sisters, you'll have enough Adam or currency, genetic modification currency, to, well, survive kind of mitigated by the fact that if you save the little sisters, not only are you doing the, the good thing, but you're also making sure well, quite frankly, they give you free plasmids, which are the powers in the game, so the ability to hypnotise these big daddy creatures hypnotise, uh, to make bees spawn out of your arm all that sort of thing. Bioshock 2 on the other hand goes, right you can harvest the little sisters or you can go through the sheer monotony of dragging them, every single one, every single one, to find a body so the little sister can drain it of Adam, drink it, and then you can take her to be rescued. And you know what? I hate that. To the point where when I played through this game last time, I killed every single one of them. And you know what? I had a nicer time. I had a, I had a more fun time, even if my daughter ended up kind of turning evil and going insane. But that's fine. Um, you know, escort missions really are the worst. They are the worst. And to have an entire game built around built around it, dreadful. Bioshock 1 had a similar had a similar part where you put you basically undergo the modifications, become a big daddy. And it's the worst part of the game because it's set after the big twist, after you after Andrew Ryan is dead, and quite frankly, it's it's fucking dreadful. Like the game kind of goes uh, cliff. At that point, and that's kind of what puts Bioshock One lower for me than Two. Two story really characters specifically really wins me over like a lot. But its gameplay loop is is terrible. It did have one thing over the original that, and I know I've been talking about Two for a, for a long time, but there's a reason. This had multiplayer. This had multiplayer. Um, I'm going to get onto the DLC everything later because it's had some multiplayer DLC as well. But, around the time um, 
I played online. I don't do that anymore because I don't care and I don't have any friends. But no, I'm kidding. But I um I don't really play online anymore. Uh, largely because most people I know don't really have a PlayStation or they don't have an Xbox series. They don't have an Xbox One or I mean, hell, I got rid of my Oculus the other day just because I didn't use it. Um, I only got it to play multiplayer with someone and they didn't. Well, we didn't ever end up playing multiplayer on it. Pointless. So, to be honest, at the time, I was kind of really getting into playing uh, multiplayer online. I was playing Bioshock 2 quite frequently. And uh, Bioshock 2 is quite an interesting multiplayer. It tries to weave into the story. So, initially opens up the when you first boot up the multiplayer. Which you can still play on Steam, by the way. So, if you, if you do that, go do it. Um, there's a guy called the Bioshock Hub. I'm going to tag, actually, in this video because he's a really cool guy. Follow him on Twitter. Um, he's covered Bioshock to death. And uh, I wish he'd cover some other stuff, like maybe Prey. Or um, I'm hoping he'll cover Judas when that comes out. Just anything to do with it. Um, I'm hoping he'll cover System Shock, uh, the System Shock remake. That'd be really cool. But yeah. Um, the multiplayer, though, was really solid. I ended up... I ended up adding, like, the top player in the world at one point, who was a guy called Hellsquake, who, um... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> he was a character. Um, he was a character, and he typically annoyed all my friends whenever he joined the chat. But, um... Yeah. Hellsquake? No, not Hellsquake. Um, that was a different guy. No. Don't know. Can't remember his name. Something Quake. But, yeah. Um... So, Yeah. Bioshock 2 was kind of the peak of me playing online multiplayer, along with Halo Reach, along with um, Gears of War 3. A lot of those kind of games from circa 2010, in, in particular 2010, um, was, was kind of the last time I really played online. I don't really do it anymore. But then we cut to three years later, Bioshock Infinite. And the, the kind of main reason I've made this video today um, I picked up something related to Bioshock Infinite recently and I'm very happy with it it's very nice yeah I'll show it off I was gonna show it off at the end no I'll, I'll, I'll save it I'll save it because I'll save it Bioshock Infinite um lauded as one of the greatest games of all time so about 10 years ago if oh god this game's 10 years old 10 years ago I would argue it's great. It dumbs down, air quotes, or simplifies or streamlines a lot of the gameplay mechanics that 1 and 2 had. Which is a shame. To some people. Um, it kind of tones down the, uh, that RPG element and turns it into way faster combat. Like, so much faster. The emphasis is on speed, it's on power, it's on just absolute insanity and you know what it's great i love i love bioshock infinite's combat that's the main reason i like this game so much its character is great as well um its villain not so much i'd argue unlike say right no one no one will ever top ryan no one will ever top ryan in the bioshock series even if they make this new one which has had a lot of problems an awful lot of problems over the years we're getting the new movie from Netflix, which is coming out soon, allegedly, which really hope just covers Rapture again. Um, but I don't think the new Bioshock's going to be any good. I think we peaked with Infinite, and that will kind of be it, unfortunately. But yeah, Infinite. Great story, very heavy on the quantum mechanics, um, confused the hell out of, out of a lot of people at the time, and as a result, people kind of went, it's amazing! It's brilliant! Oh my god! I disagree. But, I still like Infinite. Um, it's it's kind of one of those games where you just go, Oh, I think I've done playing this. I think I'm done playing Bioshock Infinite. I don't think I have to come back to this game ever again. Q three months later, you're back playing its, its combat, especially one of its DLCs, um, because it's just so goddamn good. Speaking of the DLC, um, about four or five years ago, we got Bioshock the Collection. Probably the way to play Bioshock nowadays. 
I mean, you can go back and play it on 360, but why would you? Because this has everything. Um, about the only thing it doesn't have, unfortunately, is the Bioshock 2 multiplayer. So uh, that killed that dead. Though you can still play it on Steam, as I said, go do so. But yeah, I'm mainly using this as an excuse to talk about its DLC. So for the first game, not much. Uh, not much DLC. You had two. You had the Museum of Orphaned, uh, the Museum of Orphaned Concepts, which is just literally a, oh, look at all this cut content, and we're going to shove it in a room, and that'll be the extent of the DLC. Thank you for your five pat. The other one was a challenge room. So the challenge rooms just kind of took the general core Bioshock concept and kind of did some puzzle challenges with it. It's got a pretty cool combat arena one that I go back... That's the only one I really go back to. The other two are just puzzles, and once you figure those out, there's no point going back to them. Two, on the other hand. Two had a multiplayer DLC that was fine. It, it didn't really... They added a new mode. I think it was Capture the Little Sister, um, which was kind of a cool Capture the Flag mechanic. But other than that, it wasn't particularly interesting. It added two others, though. The first was called Protector Trials, which is, hey, you know that concept of protecting a little sister that we hate God so, so goddamn much? We're going to throw that into an entire DLC. I've never played it. Like, ever. I have never played it because it is the single worst part of Bioshock 2. Why would I want to subject myself to the single worst part of Bioshock 2 all over again? No, thank you. Then we get to its story-based DLC, Minerva's Den. So Minerva's Den is the single best Bioshock story. And I know that's highly controversial. I'm sure there are people who are going, Bioshock 1 has the best Bioshock story. Bioshock Minerva's Den has the most personal story. I'd argue it's got one of the better twists, and it's kind of a microcosm of everything that makes Bioshock so goddamn fucking good. <laughs> you know? Um, just from story, its gameplay is solid. You can do the you can protect the little sisters, but you don't have to. There's no good or bad ending, it's just one ending. And it's a freaking solid ending with a very somber undercurrent and an extremely just kind... It, it's the only one with a hopeful ending. Like, one has a hopeful ending, but only if you haven't murdered a little sister. This one just flat out goes, here's some hope. Enjoy it. Um, Bioshock Infinite doesn't. Bioshock 2 does to an extent, but even then your character dies. It kind of sucks. <laughs> it's, it's a very depressing series, but... Min Minerva's Den, if you haven't, like, if you haven't played that, go fucking play it. Everything about CM Porter and his wife is just genuinely very sad. About the only thing about it that's weak is its antagonist, and even he's just kind of, he's more of just an obstacle. Yeah, I might play Minerva's Den again. <laughs> I'll finish talking about it, because it's just so damn good. Infinite. Infinite's DLC was another kettle of fish. That had three, but it was more like two. The first was called Clash in the Clouds, which, much like Bioshock 1, much like Bioshock 2, it was a combat. It was a combat simulator. And you know what? It's one of the main reasons I go back and play Infinite so much. It, it's what made me appreciate all of the little foibles of, say, the hand cannon. The hand cannon in Bioshock is flat out my favourite gun in pretty much anything. Um, it's kind of solidified my love of a big-ass pistol that can blow someone's head off. I love that. <laughs> that and the Halo 1 pistol. Anything that's just basically a pocket rifle. I'm on board. Give me. Um, that and the sniper rifle. Sniper rifle is also very good. But yeah, um, it's kind of challenge-based. You earn money to earn upgrades to then do more uh to do more of the rounds to unlock stuff in an in a museum similar to the museum of orphan concept pretty solid pretty solid dlc cheap as balls back in the day i think it was like 800 microsoft points no it might have even been 400 it was cheap as fuck but yeah buy that it's great or just buy the collection yeah um then we got to burial at sea i don't care for burial at sea I don't. Um, I think tying Columbia 
which is the so the city in Bioshock Infinite is a city in the sky and it's a city focused very heavily on American exceptionalism and look at how amazing America is when it conforms to a very particular idea of what America is which is a god-fearing land where everybody follows the teachings of some wise old prophet who's actually 36 and you know and believes in prophecy and fate and all that and all that good stuff i mean by all means believe in that not to the detriment of going oh people who are of a different skin color are terrible and people who are irish are terrible it, it's nonsense it's complete nonsense and uh, nothing gives me more pleasure than shooting those guys in the head but um burial at sea went hey you know that cool little nod we have in Bioshock Infinite where we go to Rapture temporarily because it's a multiverse story. We're going to do an entire DLC set in Rapture and I'm going to be honest with you, after two games of being set in Rapture, I didn't want to go back to Rapture. I just wanted another one set it, hell, set in alternate Columbia. You know? Set it in something that was a little like a little more similar to how Bioshock Infinite should have been. If you want to know what Bioshock, could, Bioshock Infinite could have been, go watch Go watch a video on it. It's just, honestly, it could have been a lot better. But, Burial at Sea 1 goes, hey, here's a kind of sort of Bioshocky game with a shit new weapon that you're never going to use and some shit other weapons that you're never going to use. Burial at Sea Part 2, on the other hand, goes, hey, here's a immeasurably depressing story that completely retcons pretty much everything about Bioshock 2. Because Ken Levine didn't like that game and didn't want it considered canon. So he retconned everything with a genuinely awful DLC. Um, an unsettling DLC for me. Um, in particular, the lobotomy scene. I don't do lobotomies at all. Um, it's my one massively irrational fear. And uh, <laughs> it's just... Nah. Watch, I can't even watch that scene. Um, I genuinely just sit there with my eyes closed until it's over. I can listen to it, that's fine, but watching? No. No, thank you. Um, not a fan. And, uh, yeah, no. It's, it's the retconning. It's the retconning that a lot of it does to Rapture, a lot of it does to Columbia itself. I think it's just shit. It is shit. It plays like shit. Its story is terrible. Its characters are just boring. Um, it kind of feels like a very quick reel of, oh, look at these characters. That being said, Bioshock 1 had one major problem, which was its main antagonist, which isn't Andrew Wright. It's Frank Fontaine. Frank Fontaine is a really shit antagonist when you spend the entire game knowing him as a guy called Atlas, which are kindly. Um... Would you kindly hit that like button and subscribe? That'd be nice. But yeah. Um, no. Burial at Sea, however, went, hey, let's make him an actual character. Let's make him actually intimidating. And more importantly, let's make him a good, well-rounded, well-written antagonist. And yeah, it's great. He's great. The rest of the DLC, though, is fucking shit. <laughs> but yeah. Unfortunately, that's kind of that was it for Bioshock. That was the last thing. Irrational Games shut down. Ken Levine moved on. Um, it's taken him ten years to make another game, and um, it's going to be Judas. And hopefully, it'll be good. But it's set on a spaceship, which is giving me System Shock vibes, vibes which uh, I'm not a fan of. Anyway, as I said, this whole video has just been an excuse for me to, well, showcase something I picked up the other day. That is the Songbird statue from Bioshock Infinite, uh, the collector's edition specifically, which came out about 10 years ago. And this was an expensive boy. Luckily, and he's covered in dust. Luckily, I just traded in for him. But he's really cool. Um, Songbird as an antagonist isn't particularly relevant or important. His wings are rickety. But it's probably fine, as long as I don't shake it too much. I think they're meant to stick in anyway. Yeah, there we go. 
fixed it. Yeah, so, um, you know, he's not particularly relevant, he's not particularly interesting, but he looks cool and he's a giant bird daddy. So, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that's it for my shot, guys. Uh, thank you for sticking with me. Uh, I was hoping to make this a little bit shorter, but we're coming up to the half an hour mark on a series I really fucking love. Um, I hope you have a good Christmas, and next week I'm going to be covering my top five Christmas games. I might even wear a Christmas hat. And maybe the hoodie, because I like the hoodie. It's part of who I am. It's part of, it's part of the get-up. It's part of the get-up for the channel. Anyway, uh, yeah, I hope you have a good Christmas. Um, look forward to that. It's going to be coming out on a Sunday. Um, because I don't want it coming out on Boxing Day because nobody will bloody watch it. And I don't want it coming out on Christmas Day because nobody will bloody watch it. Because you've got other stuff to watch, like the new Doctor Who, um, which is going to be interesting. Yeah, thank you guys. Uh, that is me signing off.